But he also said that he goes, well, your granddad didn't like people joining too young. So go and do something else first. So I joined the RAF, push a police dog around the RAF bases in Germany and Cyprus and the Falklands and had a bit of fun. And um, then I joined the Met in 1990. And this was just crack cocaine was just started to take hold. You think this is 1990. Once it bit, crack cocaine became a huge thing. Crack was really starting to take hold. And we just and then it starts getting lively. People, they start shouting and screaming and people pour out of the estate. And within a minute and a half, there must have been 300 people. And it was mayhem, mayhem. 50, 60 people in this site going at each other. And there were some horrible injuries there. There were broken bones. There were serious lacerations. Most murders that you solve very quickly are either domestic or silly fights that have gone wrong. I mean, the shocking fact is if a woman is murdered, it's a 50% chance that it's a, a current or former partner. Yeah, Le Levi Belfield was a serial killer. He killed um, that we know of. Um, three women, Marsha McDonnell, Amelie Delagrange and Millie Dowler. We got word from a human source that someone was touting for a contract killer to take out a couple of people. If I get upset, I apologise. Oh. But, um, because I haven't got over this and this happened in 97. Um, it was Christmas Eve, 1997. We get a phone call. Because I was having great fun, you know. I was running around the countryside behind murderers and smashing in doors and bugging up people's houses and, and putting trackers on cars in the middle of the night and being like a spy. <laughs> and I was in my own little private James Bond type movie. <laughs> So today we have with us Neil Lancaster, who is a prolific, best-selling crime author, not true crime, crime fiction. We met him at CrimeCon last year, we had a laugh in the bar with some other people, such as John Sweeney, Colin, um, Mark Williams Thomas, and we've had a few of them on the podcast so far, and Neil has had a massive career in the police spanning over two decades with London Met alone and also over five years in the police in the army actually in the RAF in the RAF yeah in I was RAF. RAF police and believe it or not he's a scouser yeah, <laughs> yeah. I lost my I've lost the old accent um because we moved away quite a long time ago but uh yeah by birth I'm a, I'm a scouser so if you want to follow Neil on his socials or you want to check his books out, there will be links in the description box below this video. So a huge thank you for coming on, Neil. Yeah. My pleasure. Disrupting your life in a, a beautiful remote part of Scotland. No, it's fine. It's fine. I had a nice drive down yesterday and uh, stayed up in a Premier Inn. Uh, nice big breakfast this morning. I'm raring to go. <laughs> Fantastic. So as a young person then, did you aspire to get into the police and the area? Um... It's a funny story, really, which is probably worth me going into because it's quite interesting. Is It's in the blood. My grandfather on my dad's side was a cop in Liverpool. He was in what was called then the Liverpool City Police. And he policed Scotland Road. Scotty Road, as it's called. Scotty Road, which is probably a, re it's a really hard-edged part. Of I think it's so bad now, but back in the day, it was something incredible. But my, my grandfather, a slight family history lesson here, but it's, it's, I think it's worth saying. He was... Um, we thought he was an orphan. We actually learned. I managed to get hold of his police uh, police record. And it turns out he wasn't orphaned, but his father died when he was um, about six. Now, in those days, there was no welfare state. If you couldn't afford to look after your kids, they went to the workhouse. So quite literally, just like in, what was what's the show? Is it Matilda or something like that? He went to the workhouse. Um, so he went to the workhouse, stayed there, did his schooling and everything, and then... He got kicked out at 14 and he went, got a rail warrant to go to Chatham and he joined the 7th Dragoon, Dragoon Guards as a band boy at 14, <laughs> which is pretty crazy. And this would be in sort of in, uh, before the First World War. 
So he then went off, and there was the First World War, and he, he was a cavalryman, and he was, a, he was also a bandsman, very talented French horn player. And he fought in, um, in Egypt during the First World War. And then this is, I've got all this from his police records. And then he comes back from the war and he has nowhere to go. Literally, he has the clothes on his, his D-mob suit and that's it. So he goes back to the workhouse, goes to the workhouse and applies to join Liverpool City Police. But he's too short. He's only a small guy. Back in those days, he had to be five foot nine. And he was five foot six and three quarters. But the chief constable, and I've seen the memo, intervened on his behalf and saying, no, I need a French horn player for the band. And he got in. And that's how he got in. And so that was there. And he sat and he had a, a very, very celebrated career. He was known, he was the station sergeant, which in Liverpool back in those days was something important. They carry a big stick, pace stick. And he was known for meeting out instant justice with his pace stick. Liverpool must have been wild back then, even wilder than right, right down on the docks, yeah. I mean, he would pol police, you know, Liverpool docklands. So it's, it, it carried through to my dad. But my dad was five for eight and wasn't tall enough to join the police <laughs> and couldn't play a French horn. So he couldn't get in. Cuban heels? <laughs> well, yeah, you'd have thought so. So he ended up in a building trade. You know, he was a joiner. And, um, but then, you know, we moved down south, down to Kent. Um, I grew up in Kent. And, but my dad sold me the idea of being a cop. But he also said that he goes, well, your granddad didn't like people joining too young. So go and do something else first. So I joined the RAF. So was your dad heartbroken that he couldn't get in then? I think I think it it was a lifelong disappointment for him. I mean, he was he was a builder, but I, in the building trade, and then he worked for the council. You know, we lived on a council estate. There wasn't a lot of money going around, but it was a great life. I had a fantastic childhood. You know, knocking around the estate with my mates and everything, and two loving parents. So I, I wasn't in any way underprivileged. I feel privileged. And I think it was a disappointment to him that he couldn't be a cop. So what he did was live vicariously through me. <laughs> and um, I went, obviously, to the military police first, which was fine. I used to push a police dog around uh, RAF bases in Germany and Cyprus and the Falklands and had a bit of fun. And um, then I joined the Met in 1990. So what was the training like for the RAF? Um, it was just typical military, square bashing, cleaning stuff that was already clean being shouted at by instructors. But it's a different time. This was sort of 83 I joined and we were in the middle of the Cold War. So whereas there was this great big threat, which we're obviously seeing revisited right now, very strangely, you know, we were a, we were a fairly big nuclear power then. The Air Force had nuclear weapons, which they don't anymore. They're all on the subs. So we would just patrol the nuclear weapons sites. I mean, it was painfully boring. But... It was a good laugh, you know, because we were a gang of young lads all together and it was pretty good fun. So, you know, the training was, you did your basic training, which was just all the square bashing and all that sort of stuff and cleaning things, um, being shouted at. And then we did your trade training for the police, which is learning about the law, military law, all that sort of thing. And then I went on and did the dog course where you'd get teamed up with a dog and you'd, you'd learn to, to work with your dog. I really enjoyed that. That was really great fun. I'm a massive dog lover and... Working with a police dog was huge fun. So you had a massive bond with that dog? Brilliant. Well, yeah, I mean, I had two, three dogs during my six years because, you know, sometimes you you know move overseas, you wouldn't take your dog with you. Go down to um, the Falklands, you got teamed up with the dog for four months because it was a four-month tour. And these were big old crazy dogs, you know. These are the ones that the, even the regular police didn't want because they were too mental. Um, but it was good. I really did enjoy that. It was, and it put, sort of put into me this lifelong love of, of, of dogs. What happened in the Falklands? The Falklands, not a great deal. This was in 1988. So the war was well over. Um, again, it was just patrolling the sites. I mean, quite, quite often because you'd get, it, it was, it was quite a small, it was smallish base, Mount Pleasant, RAF Mount Pleasant, right sort of slap bang in the middle. And there was a small detachment at Stanley, it's a very strange place, the Falklands. It reminds me of sort of Dartmoor. But the people are as English as anywhere else you'll find. They really are, honestly, and they're very proud to be British. Um, so really, we were about patrolling the sites, patrolling the sensitive areas, patrolling where the aircraft were parked up. And um, we would get called in if there would be... Because quite often, some of the soldiers, if they'd been out for a while, or even worse, if like a sub came in... And they'd been submerged for a while. 
the the mat lows would come off and it would be carnage so we would be there to try and <laughs> keep a little bit of good order with a snarling german shepherd but <laughs> mostly it was fine you know we used to go walking on the beaches penguins all the seabirds it was all right i had a good time so there was no hurry moments in that yeah. career. Got a bit close to minefields once or twice, but really there wasn't anything happening. I honestly, I, I'd love to have some war stories to tell from my, <laughs> my time in the military. I mean, if I could get my son in here, who's a Royal Marine commando, he could tell you some hairy stories about being in the military. I wish I could, but I can't really. Just a bit of snarling dogs occasionally and, you know. So what prompted the planned transition to the cops? It, it had always been the plan. yeah. From joining, it had been the plan. I'll do this for six years, and then I'll join the Met. I didn't want to be moved around every uh, two two years. 18 months, two years, you're going to get posted. I didn't want that. I had a family by this time. So I wanted stability, and I'd always wanted to be a cop. Ever since, really, I, I had a serious thought about what do I want to do in my life. I, I wanted to be a cop, probably because of my dad. And what age were you at this time? 24. 24. Why London Met? I can't actually remember. I th I think it was a purely practical reason. I mean, my family all live in Kent. So I guess, you know, like the, the, the obvious choice would have been Kent Police or Met Police. I did apply for Nottinghamshire Police because my wife, my wife at that time, was from Nottingham, but they wouldn't take my application until I had, I don't know, three months to go or something. The Met said, just apply, apply now, when I had, I think, 18 months, two years left. So I had a job. But, you know, a year before I left the RAF, I had a job lined up. They were ready to take me. And what position was that? I just joined, as a, as everyone does, I joined the Met as a, a beat cop. Beat cop. Yeah, you, I went, it was 20 weeks training at Hendon, quite intense lots of a lot of classroom learning did you have to um, do, attend an autopsy no see that's I, I did attend autopsies quickly um, in fact I attended an autopsy before I joined the Met I attended an autopsy because somebody knew someone at Northwick Park Hospital in Harrow when I was in the RAF and they thought it'd be an interesting exercise with the RAF policeman to go and see it, which it is. It is a it is a useful exercise um, for anyone where you might have to encounter death. It, it don't get worse than that, so you know it, it, nothing's going to be too much of a shock after that. What happened at that autopsy then? Yeah, Hold was the victim. I think, I think he was quite a young man, and I think he'd um, committed suicide. Oh dear. Um, I think he jumped off a railway bridge. In fact, he had he jumped off a railway bridge. And it was it was quite funny actually. You talk about you now me being a fiction author, and you know I don't write true crime, but what I do is I go back into this sort of mine of people I've met and use them to influence characters. Now the most autopsies, yeah, I mean you see you've you've got a pathologist who's like a, a doctor, but you've also got the mortuary technician. The, I can't remember what they're called now. They've got a proper title, but they're the the technicians they're not doctors they are just like the mechanics they do the work so they prepare the body and he was a really odd character he had sleeve tattoos he had a massive great beard and a skinhead and he was playing thrash metal when we went in there <laughs> and he was all right geezers all right how you doing you come here to see it today right i've got a good one for you today <laughs> and um I, can, I you know didn't i just thought it was funny at the time but then when i was writing a book with an autopsy scene for one for was it the most recent one and um i thought oh yeah i'll use that because it's funny you know it's funny and it's notable so yeah i mean i, I mean i saw if oh, i went to quite a few autopsies during my time in the met but the first so, the first one this one you're describing now yeah were you in shock at seeing this for the first time yeah i mean first off i'd never seen a dead body before that moment and so you just walk in and there's this fairly broken up body on the slab so to speak you know legs are obviously all smashed up and he was quite a young man as well and then you look at it and the bloke goes he turns all the music off and he, he's at, actually a serious professional he despite the exterior and he goes look i've got to tell you that the worst bit he goes is what i'm about to do he goes and it's the first cut and they do the first cut and obviously it's literally bang stop, top to bottom so he did that and that was like, wow because you're not used to this. But then, I don't know, somehow you sort of, I then started viewing it as an educational exercise. 
And it was actually really interesting. You know, you once you separate yourself from the fact that that was once a living, breathing human being, this is now just an empty, an empty vessel. This is just a piece of meat. And I was able to separate that. And then we got interested in you. You know, they take it to bits. They take your organs out. They take the top of the head out. They peel the face back, quite literally. Uh, and they do this particular cut. And then they literally, like a mask, peel the face back. But even that he got hit by a train, was his face intact? He didn't get hit by a train. He just, he jumped off a railway bridge. But there was oh, no... There, there tra- was no He train. might not have even... He jumped off a bridge. And whether it was a rail... I can't remember that. Because oh. this is a long time ago. So he snapped his legs. Then. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, he wasn't mangled. I mean, I've, I've been to railway incidents and, yeah, that's another story. Um, but, you know, autopsies, you, you can disassociate. Oh, there's one time I can't. And I, it, well, it lives with me to this very day. I, do I talk about this? Because it's hard. Yeah, I'll tell you what I will, because it's important. If I get upset, I apologise. Oh. But... Um, because I haven't got over this. And this happened in 97. Um, it was Christmas Eve, 1997. We get a phone call. I've just joined the CID. And I get a call from um, the control room. They said, we've got a cop death at the north end of the borough. <sighs> this is like five, five o'clock or something. And I, we, so we drive up there. Because a cop death is treated as an unexplained death. You have to be sure that there's nothing suspicious. Now, like it or not, this does happen. It does happen. Parents do sometimes kill their kids so we go there and the doctor's there and the fme they're called forensic medical examiner so he's just a doctor he's like a local gp but they train to work with the police and and go to scenes and things like that and he says i'm not saying it's suspicious he goes but there's something in the hypostasis on the face that i don't like hypostasis is what when you die obviously your heart stops beating and the the blood settles now, normally that means, obviously, if you die on your back, all the all the blood will have settled along your back and back of your legs and your uh, and your backside and things like that. He goes, there's some in the nose that suggests you may have been turned post-mortem. And yet the parents aren't saying that they have been. So we go, OK, fine. So we brought it in. And back in those days, you'd report up to what was known as the lab sergeant. Call him a crime scene coordinator now. And then the coroner's officer who works for the coroner. The coroner said... I want a PM tonight because it's Christmas Eve. And if this is a homicide, we need to act immediately. So Christmas Eve, 1997, I've got two young kids of my own at home. I'm there stood again, coincidentally, at Northwick Park with this perfect 18-month-old baby. And I have to witness the same process. And I was sort of numb watching it. I knew this was different. And I'd seen a number of PMs since then that and i'd been relaxed about it but i wasn't about this and i was struggling with it and obviously went through the process which i'm not going to talk about and it turns out there was no this hypostasis was explainable and the uh the pathologist there said look this is sudden infant death syndrome no suspicious circumstances but i i i remember going back to the police station with my friend and he looked at me and i just i didn't know what to do I couldn't, it's like someone had uncogged something out of my brain because my brain was going mental. And I went into the locker room and I just felt a surge of like anger at myself because I'm thinking, I'm feeling sorry. What the fuck have I got to feel sorry about my language? Am I allowed to swear? Yeah. Right, I'll say it again. What the fuck have I got to be upset about? I've still got my two boys sat at home. These people, what's Christmas going to be for them for the rest of their life? And I ended up like smashing my locker up, you know, punching and cut my knuckles open and everything because I was so angry and with myself and upset and didn't know how to deal with it. And I came out and I sorted myself out and my mate, who's quite an experienced old boy, said, let's go and have a beer. And we had a beer and I went home and I've... Christmas is is affected for me. I I won't get over it. And I thought, but I accept that, you know? I accept I won't get over it and maybe that's okay. And maybe that's okay that I'll be sad about it. And I do shed a tear every single Christmas when I think about it. Um, I wrote a piece about it um, for the Huffington Post one year. I, I, I couldn't, it was a nightmare to write. I was in floods of tears. My wife said, stop, don't do it, don't do it. Stop, just tell them you can't do it. And I said, no, it's important. So sorry to, yeah, sorry to lower the tone, but no. I, did, I, want, I, I want to tell the, 
this because you know what we push cops out onto the street and it's literally day to day you can be going from that and from things like that straight into something else and then straight onto something else and then straight onto something else and expect them not to need a minute to reflect on some of these things and to perhaps try and deal with how they're feeling about it um so you know i i'm i'm always keen to well not keen to talk about it but i always think it's important to talk about these things and get them out in the open because you know we and you'd be pretty inhuman if that didn't affect you you know i you know i'm a a parent to three kids now and it still lives with me at this day Definitely, it's really important, and I've learned so much from interviewing ex-cops of what you know you have to go through, and it's, it is mind blowing. So, yeah, we salute you. So, once you went through your training, then where were you assigned? What part of London? I went to Northwest London, um, Brent Borough. Then it was they they change how they subdivide the stations, but it was known then as uh, Kilburn Division, and I was sent to Harleston Police Station, which is northwest. Northwest London. It's um, it was very very busy area, very diverse. At that time, it had the biggest Caribbean population in Europe. A lot of gangs um, then. Yeah, some very serious gang problems. Um, you had a couple of big estates um, that still beef badly with each other: Ch- uh, Stonebridge Estate and um, the Church End Estate. And you'll hear there's quite a lot of beef raps going on between. That those those two estates and you know, there's been murders between them because of this nonsense uh, um so yeah i went there it was and it was a good it was a good place to work a good place to work because you got exposed to everything straight away um there was a lot of resentment it did have the feeling a bit of fort apache the bronx but in amongst it all there were some amazing people you know you'd meet amazing people um and the deprivation was was shocking, really. Um, and uh, racism. Did it exist? Yeah, it probably did exist. It probably did exist. Um, but it, it was a good place to police, but it was a hard place to police. Um, what were the challenges? Resentment. The fact that if you would stop someone, you know, legitimately, the, the, the Stonebridge Estate had a precinct. Um, with like a chippy and a, a, a news agent and the drug dealing on there was rife it was absolutely rife and this was just crack cocaine was just started to take hold you think this is 1990 it, it took a while to get established but it was and when it once it bit crack cocaine became a huge thing obviously there was still heroin dealing going on still weed being dealt but crack was really starting to take hold um, so there's an enormous amount of drug dealing going on on Stonebridge Estate so but if you would try and you'd see something going on, you'd go across and think, well, I'm going to have a word with them, stop them. And with a second, within a second, because of how the state's constructed with building there, building, you know, you've got the precinct and then you've got a big tall building there, another big tall, another big tall building. And within seconds, if they started making a fuss, you could find yourself in a whole world of pain with loads of people coming out and yeah, I had some very, very frightening moments. Could you just um, take you know. us through them? Well, I remember one particular case. This was on the Church End Estate. We were on a patrol. We were on it in a van, and there was about six of us in this van. And there's this gang of three lads walking along the street, smoking spliffs. And one of them looked at us and laughed, walked over, and literally took a drag on the, on the fag, uh, on the spliff, and blew it into the face of the... Dra- and we, Cheeky butt. So out we get, grab hold of them. <laughs> but Church End Estate was even worse in some ways, even though it's not such a high rise estate as Stonebridge, it's much lower. Um, sort of three sort of like long tenement types, um, but you know, sort of more modern 1970s monstrosities. And they kicked off massively, you know, about being, despite the fact it was a totally legit stop, you know, they were walking around smoking spliffs and you can't mistake the smell. I mean, this stuff. And they weren't even trying to hide it. It was almost like, and it, you, I did wonder, looking back on it, was it just a come on? Was this just to, anyway? So we go in and we grab them, and we just, and then it starts getting lively. People, they start shouting and screaming, and people pour out of the estate. And there were six of us, and within a minute and a half, there must have been three hundred people. So we're shouting up for urgent assistance and all this sort of thing. And oh, we had one of the prisoners taken off us. All of us got assaulted. I mean, not seriously. 
And unfortunately, then the assistance came and we were managed to get out of there. But I had a because a minute in that situation feels like a long time. So, yeah, that was scary. Did you think you were going to get hurt more than you did? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got a couple of bumps and bruises, nothing too serious. Um, but it, yeah, that that caused a moment or two's reflection. When you say so, the prisoner got took off you, how did they get took off Literally ripped you? the van doors open because this was a, a, the vans are much better nowadays. They've got internal cages and all this sort of thing. These were just, this again is probably 92. These are just a transit van. It literally was just a transit van with bench seats down the side. And you couldn't really lock them properly. So they just literally dragged you off with some. So was that usual for gang life back then? I wouldn't say it was usual. It did happen. And in reflecting upon that, it was probably the, the best thing to have done would have been to say, on you go. <laughs> go on then. You want to blow? We'll get you next time sort of thing. Um, In a situation like that, do you go back and try and get that prisoner again? Oh, we did get him again. We did. We knew who he was. We found out who he was. And we went and got him a couple of days later, which is often the smarter, the smarter option. You can do it where you've got the correct resources with you and, you know... Was he at home alone? Six in the morning, get, yeah. take a team and this exactly. that kind of thing. Exactly, yeah. you can give him the early morning wake up with the big red key, as they always say. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, yeah. That was, that was frightening. Um, there were one or two things. You do get involved in some things where you, uh, you know... I had a knife pulled on me once. Um, funnily enough, the most serious effort to really, really hurt me was by a woman. Wow, we we go down. It's in a, around the back end of Harlesden, and someone says there's a woman there with a knife. So we go down, and I go, and she's got this massive, great big knife, and then I go, wait, put it down. And she wasn't young either, and she's literally like this, trying. And I'm way. It wasn't. <laughs> it's not like you know. I'd have been a lot more worried if it was a a 19 year old lad. So we fortunately we had a short shield in the back of the van. You know, like the. The short riot shield. So I want to grab that. And so we could just deflect it off. <laughs> bang, deflect it off. Bang. And she was absolutely crazy. I mean, she was. She had, a, she had was schizophrenia. She big, schizophrenia, I think. <laughs> and in the end, I got sick of it. So I pulled out my truncheon and I said, you've got one more chance. And then I, this is going straight across the middle of your head. And she went, okay. And stuck it in the tree. And so she got arrested and went back. And she was she was well known, and she was known for knives and things like that. So she was strip searched by some a couple of um, female officers, and came back, put in a cell, and then I'm laughing, but it's not funny. And then I think it was about half an hour later, she she managed she'd secreted a razor blade somewhere, I think in her mouth or elsewhere, and she put oh, a gash whoa. across her neck. I mean, not more of a self harming gash than an attempt to kill herself. But then, so yeah, that was that was probably the most serious attempt to really, really hurt me. What happened to her? I think she was, I can't remember. I think she was probably sectioned at that point because she did have some really serious problems. But, you know, mental health was, men, mental health dominates policing nowadays. Back then, there, there was more capacity at the psychiatric units. Now, it's a total nightmare. So how long were you like a trainee for? You do, well, you, obviously your training is 20 weeks. Um, you then go to what they call a street duties course where you work with like a tutor constable where they start giving you a bit more rope, bit more rope. And then after 10 weeks, you're out on your own. And then you get assigned to a team or what they used to call reliefs back in the day. For some reason, I never really understood. And then you go to a relief and you work with the team, which is, they nowadays, they would call a response team. And you're there going off to answer the 999 calls, to get out and amongst it, to try and detect crime, prevent crime, you know, looking in the areas of high burglaries, who's moving about late at night, stopping people, searching them, all that sort of thing. And you would need to do two years total service, probation. And from then on, you'd be confirmed as a constable. And then you were in so to speak can you remember your first serious 999 call <sighs> it's a long time ago now I, I mean literally one that stands out there were, honestly it was but it was constant because it was always and it, it was all the time you were just running from 999 call to 999 call um and it was it was terrific fun you know what's not fun about screaming around in london with a 
in a what well, you know in a car with what was it Sierras? They were the the, the area cars were Vo- were Ford Sierras back then. And you're screaming around in these, going to 999 calls, going to burglary calls, suspects on premises calls, fights. It was great fun. I, I absolutely loved it. And I, I did it. I stayed in uniform for seven years because I enjoyed it so much. Um, but then I decided I wanted to change. I wanted to become a detective. So I started on the detective program. What were your most challenging 999 calls? Do you know what? I mean... Going to a pub fight, something like that, they're, they're challenging, but, you know, you get enough people there, they're, they're good fun. There's no getting away from it. They're good fun. <laughs> take, take us through one of them, then, going to a pub fight. <laughs> I tell you what, I won't do that. I'll do th- this one because it's, it's even more impressive. It's, <laughs> there was a very large traveller's site just off the North Circular Road from Wembley. It was called Book Centre, and it's just not far from where Ikea and Tesco's is. And... On a bank holiday, you knew something was going to go off at one of these sites. And especially if there'd been a wedding or a christening or something like that. And we went there. And I remember there wasn't many of us about a really busy night. And I was in a van with another guy. And we drove down to this site. And they said, reports of serious disturbance. And we had a big old torch. So we go in. You could hear it. And you're thinking, I'm not going in there. And you look around the corner and shone this big dragon light in, used to call them. And it was mayhem, mayhem. 50, 60 people in this site going at each other. Baseball bats, everything. And you just had to go, oh my God, I'm not going in there. <laughs> so you just had to shout it up for assistance. And you had to, we had to get assistance from all over to go in. And then we went in and it was mostly over. And there were some horrible injuries there. There were broken bones. There were serious lacerations. There was... I think there were some stab injuries, all sorts. And do you know how many complaints we got? Zero. Zero. Not a single one. (laughs) Not a single one. But they were the sort of the notable ones. I mean, the rest of them, it just became routine. It became routine to go to outside a pub and it was all kicking off outside. People, And you know what it's like. We've all seen it. It's 90% of the time it's handbags. Nobody really wants to fight. What they want to do is that, and it's all this bouncing on the toes and, you know, oh, come on in. But none of them really want to fight. So mostly Did you dissipates. ever ride a police horse? Then? No, Because no, we no. used to have them all the time on night, you know, when it yeah. was a busy night out. They're a, I mean, they're an amazing resource, but that's a very specialised bit of policing. And there's a, a very particular type of person who goes into that type of police work. Mm. It's someone who doesn't want their weekends off in the football season, that's for no. sure. Um, but yeah, no, no, no. I very rarely did anything to do with horses. That was very much a public order situation. Did you have to attend any houses where it, the occupants were suspected deceased? Oh, yeah. Oh. All the time. What was your first one of them like? Um, again, they all sort of merge into one. Because there were so... Oh, no, I can remember it. I can't, actually, I'll tell you this. It's quite funny. And I do laugh about it because you can laugh about death. When death comes at an appropriate time... It's, it's, you know, you can't get too hit up about it. Certainly when you're doing it for a living. I remember it really well. Um, your, your typical deceased behind locked doors is, you know, they're 99% of the time, 9.9% of the time, they're not suspicious because people are dying all the time, everywhere. You live, you die. Exactly. We live, we die. There are people being born all the time. There are people dying all the time. I remember we got a call, suspected collapse behind locked doors, um, Someone can't raise their dad on the phone. They don't live locally and he's never out in the night. So we go along and lift up the door flap. Oh, yes. Mm, But not too bad. Not too bad. So we have to, we force entry and he's an old guy and he's dead like this in his armchair. Just dead. Quite peaceful. The door was locked on the inside. The keys were still in. All the windows were locked. And uh, it's just, this is going to sound awful, but it's just a reflection of how things were and how you treat these things. I'm with this guy who'd been in for 28, 29 years, proper old London boy, proper old London, big beard, ex-paratrooper, ex-boxer. He was a lovely bloke, but he he was a character, shall we say. And he goes in, he goes, oh, right, okay, you phoned it in, son. Yeah, I phoned it in. What they're saying for the undertaker, at least two hours. 
So he then sits down on the sofa, equivalent to where you are, and he, I'm not lying, he does this, he goes, <laughs> gets the remote control, puts the telly on and goes, put the kettle on, son. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 there, are my, there are some people who might think that's, that's terrible it's disrespectful I, I beg to disagree I think that's I think that's okay psychologically it's a tool to get through the job isn't well, it, it the gallows humour yeah mm. it is it is and I, I you know a collapse behind locked doors they're so common and I, I dealt with countless over my time some, some live with you some don't it, it's a funny thing memory because I dealt with so many. I mean, it must be dozens. Um, but I remember very little about them. I, I, one that sticks in the mind is a guy phones us, and this is when I was working at Wilsdon Green, which is just in the sort of uh, the, the sort of more west end of, of Brent. And we go along, and there's a guy there. He goes, I can't get hold of my mate. And he, I know he went into the flat last night, and we got badly drunk last night, like really badly drunk. We... We had a, a bet to see you could drink the most whiskey out of a bottle in one go. Okay. He goes, and he did nearly a whole bottle of Jack Daniels. And oh, I'm like, okay. So we go through the door, <clears throat> and he's dead in bed. And he was only young, early 20s. He just drunk himself to death. And again, the same thing, doors he locked. He choked on his vomit or something? I think just alcohol poisoning. Because, you know, y- your body can only process so much alcohol. And you'll, you'll get to a point that you'll have organ failure almost because you've overloaded your liver. To, you can't take that much in one go. So I think he, there was, he hadn't vomited. I think it was just alcohol poisoning. He'd overdone what his liver could process. So he was lying asleep, and he was like lying asleep like this. You know how you know a lot of people do, sort of using his hands to cradle. So I did it, and he was cold. I went down and said, "Look, I'm sorry, mate. Your, your mate's passed away." And so we we do the usual thing. I get the doctor to come round to pronounce life extinct paramedics can do that nowadays not just doctors he comes around and he goes no i'm completely happy that's going to be alcohol poisoning um so he goes and then you have to wait for the undertakers to come so then the undertakers come and they come up and they've got the body bag and they've got like a stretcher but this guy this is trigger warning rigor mortis had set in so when we have because you know we have to you've got i mean we've got to search the body you've got to make sure there are no injuries and things like that on it so we lift him up but he's remained frozen in this position. And it was a right struggle to get him into the body bag. Now, that stuck with me in my head. Now, that I still remember in vivid Technicolor. And I was talking to a bloke about this, a guy I used to work with a couple of years ago. And I was saying, do you remember that one we went to? Because you used to do, like, quite often you'd, you'd be a van posting together and you'd work together for a month. Or if you're on the area car, you know, the fast response car, you'd work together for a month so you could get used to each other and teamwork and all that. I goes, do you remember that one with the bloke and picking him up? And he was like that. And he went, I do remember that one. He goes, but I'm surprised you don't remember the one we went to the next week. I go, what was that? He goes, that bloke had an axe in his head. Huh? I went, oh, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Now, is, but what's strange is how your mind processes these things, you know? And it, it's, it is shocking. I, I remember another one. I mean, sorry, you cops again. Sorry, the, can we go back? How did the guy get that axe in the head? Oh, someone hit him in the head with an axe. Mate? <laughs> yeah, a mate. Now, he didn't die. I don't know how, but he literally had an axe in his head. I'd forgotten about that. But the peaceful, non-suspicious death, tragedy though it was because he was so young, is imprinted on my brain. And that just always interests me. Why, why does memory work like that? Perhaps it was so horrific it blocked it out. I, maybe. Or, or, I don't know. Is was was it, he conscious or, or unconscious? He was still talking. And he survived? Yeah. So he just couldn't, could he not move? He, he, was, he was vaguely conscious, but he was there. And I can remember the blood... And then when I got to it, the blood was just everywhere. Oh. And was it deep? Pretty deep. And it's it's just but I'm I'm just interested in the fact that I didn't particularly remember that. And I was chatting to another mate of mine and we, we went into one and sometimes you'll go to a sudden death where the people have been there weeks or months and you've got to search them. You've got to so like we've had it where we you've had to get like a, a two-month-old corpse and you pick it up by the hair so you can look underneath to make sure there's not a knife or... or they whatever. follow maggots by then. Oh, God, yeah. Oh. And the smell. The smell is something that lives with you. And 
the funny thing about that is that's instantaneous. I, I always say within seconds of someone dying, I can smell it. it within seconds. It, 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 I don't know. It just has this, this thing. You can smell it. I mean, when it's really, you can almost taste it when it's horrible. And it can, sorry, this is disgusting. I really oh, no, should have I put smelled trigger her body. Warnings. Sorry? I smelled her dead body. I had a guy below me die. He hung himself. But me yeah. and my friends, the only reason we recognised it is because yeah, we walked past the flat door. It fucking it, stunk. No, it is. It's, yeah. it's, it's vile. And I've been to so many and it does live with you and uh, you know you can you can almost visualise it mm. when when you look back on these things so yeah I, I always find it interesting so yeah I mean death is, is a constant thing and I worked in homicide teams and things so you know there's this too many stories I could tell. Some of them, I guess, I've tried to block out. But so you've you've described like coming to a house and it's obvious, you know, it's natural causes. You've described axe in the head, obvious there was a situation. What about when you arrive at the house and you're not sure and you've got to investigate further and it is suspicious? Well, that's it because it isn't always that obvious, and so you've got to be careful. I mean, there are some very good clues. You know, there are always some very good clues about what state the house is in, things like that. But it's always better to err on the side of caution. There are some, I mean, but you cannot go and call a full forensic response to every homicide, to every, sorry, to every dead body, because there's not enough people to do that. You've got, like, you've got homicide assessment teams that will re react to this. You've got crime scene managers, crime scene coordinators, um, fingerprint photographs, all that. You cannot have that response to every sudden death. Otherwise, there'd be no time for the actual homicides. Could you take us through one that was trickier to figure out? Um, yeah, yeah, one. Um, God, yeah. Got a call to um, an address. Where would this be? This was in this was in Islington. I'd moved. I'd, I was a detective by now. I'd, I'd left Kilburn and gone to Islington. And I got a call. There's collapse behind locked doors. There's a guy on the bed. He is um, lying on the bed. He's fully closed and he's got quite a significant, not a significant injury, but he's got an injury to his mouth and nose. But what looked to me like he'd been punched in the face. And his son's there outside. Now, the uniform cops have gone there and forced entry and found this guy. And he's obviously heard about it. And he is getting very angry. He wants to go in. This lad wants to go in. And he's getting threatening. He's threatening. Either you let me in, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick off. And I'm there. I'm the, I'm the detective here. I'm a DC by this point, so I'm technically in charge of the scene. So I'm having to try and deal with this guy. Now my instinct was, because again they said, well the door was locked from the inside. There was no sign of forced entry, but there'd obviously been some sort of an incident before. So on that one, I very much thought, well something's happened to him. And has that caused him to die after? I don't know. Has he got brain hemorrhage? Because it's, it's so much you, you don't know. There's, the injuries that you see on the, on the surface don't necessarily reflect the injuries that are inside, particularly when it comes to head injuries. Because someone can get thumped, fall over, hit their head on the pavement, have a fairly minor abrasion, but inside they've got a subdural hematoma, that, that kills them. Now that happens more often than than you know. It really does, which is why I've always warned my kids, you know, particularly my big, huge, hard case of a Marine son, don't get involved in pub fights because especially a big, hard lad like him, one punch can kill someone and then you're on the wrong end of a manslaughter charge. So yeah, that one, I had a big doubt in my mind. I didn't know. Now my instinct was probably it wasn't but you couldn't, so I had to go, f I went full response on that. I heard on the foot side of caution, I got the duty officer down, I called the on-call um, detective inspector, and we got a crime scene manager down, and they managed the scene, etc., etc., etc. But then, of course, you do it, you preserve it, You the, the what it was was the lab sergeant, as we used to use him in those days, they would preserve the body for transportation, so they would bag up the hands, all that sort of thing, to prevent any loss of evidence from the body, then transport the body. And then it would go be go for a special post-mortem, because you've got two types of post-mortem. You've got a standard post-mortem, when there's no suspicious circumstances. Then you've got a special, which tends to be much quicker, and tends to be obviously done to a forensic standard, where the whole purpose of that is to find out how they died, and is it a homicide? What is the cause of the death, and is it a homicide? This podcast is sponsored by Harry's. 
Harry's is way more than a super sharp razor company. They're here to revamp your whole routine, from close shaves and flake-free hair, all the way to clear, healthy skin. Harry's helps guys feel great. For this sponsorship, Harry's is offering a free travel-sized shower gel with a trial set to you, the viewers, to give you a chance to try their other products as well as shave. Please make sure to support this podcast and give your own shower shave a go by redeeming a free Harry's trial set. All you cover is £3.95 for delivery. Just head to harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, to have your set delivered and start a shave plan. Your freebie will be added at checkout. That's harrys.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting Harry's. Link is in the description box below this video. Now, um, there was a special PM. And when we had a bit of a, it, it was a difficult situation with the family. Understandably, I understand why they were sad and they were angry and they seemed to be blaming us and they seemed to be blaming me personally that we weren't doing enough. Had a meeting with the family and I thought we were really going to have a problem with them and they were going to get like get, get solicitors and all this sort of thing. And I said, look, I promise you we're doing it. You know, the scene was properly preserved. We, and, you know, we are tracing his movements that night. We had to go back to the pub he'd been in. And there was some suggestion that there'd been a bit of a minor argument inside or outside the pub but nothing serious and he'd gone off angry and gone off and stormed off home and that was the picture we had um the post-mortem showed that he'd had a heart attack now uh, and the opin opinion of the pathologist was that it wasn't necessarily brought on by any trauma therefore it was viewed as natural causes but that was one that was very much either or and was difficult because i had a very angry family to to manage in the end they accepted it and you know we, we all we parted in on good terms and I didn't nobody complained about me anyway so yeah it can be very tricky it can be very very tricky because it isn't always as clear as the nose on your face I mean quite literally here it was it could be it could be but you've got to err on the side of caution exactly so have you had, had any more suspicious deaths oh, you've God, really man. turned around and thought yeah. yeah, oh, loads, yeah. I mean, lo oh, too many. I mean, I, I you know, um, I remember there was one young lad. I mean, he was one of my early arrests. Um, and he was a nice lad. He wasn't the brightest. He was a young lad who was just on the periphery of getting involved in the gangs. I suppose he was about 12. So they would be calling him... I know you've heard, you've probably heard all these of the people you talk about. In in a lot of the the inner city gangs, particularly the black gangs, you'll have the tinies, you'll have the youngers, you'll have the elders. And he would have been one of the tinies at the time. And he was a nice lad. I quite liked him. And he was sparky and funny and um, things like that. And he would get into a bit of bother, but nothing serious. But then... I sort of moved away from that particular part, so I didn't encounter him quite so much. And I then got a, we then got a call saying there's been a shooting on the church end. This is a couple of years later. Now, this lad by that time had grown a lot, and he was, he'd gone from being a short, fat lad to being a big lad, you know, a big six foot two, six foot three, and was firmly within the gangs. And they said, there's a guy been shot on the church end estate. I don't know who he is. And I said, well, shall I have a look? Because I'm... I was familiar with a lot of the guys on the church end of state. I went to look and it was him. And I was really sad, you know. I was really sad because he he was uh, fundamentally, with the right upbringing, with the right people around him, he could have been a decent person. But he didn't have a chance. And because of his his family was dysfunctional in the extreme, um... There was, there was mental illness within the family. Brother was in jail. Mum was involved in drugs. And it, I, I viewed that as a real tragedy. And I just thought, there's this young lad I used to see as a 12-year-old who was cheeky, sparky, fundamentally good. And here he is now, dead on this estate. And it seems so, so senseless. And yeah, he was involved in drugs. He was running drugs. Maybe he'd been involved in gun, guns himself. But... It just always then struck me that it's not a level playing field, you know. And 
how much free will do we really have? And that, I think, was where I walked away from that. I walked away with that feeling really, really sad. Did they ever catch a killer? Yeah. That, that preempted a load of tit-for-tat killings. There was quite a few around Harlesden around that particular time. There must have been about seven or eight tit tit for tat killings. I forget most of the names now because, you know, it's so many years ago. All teenagers, were they? Yeah, mostly, mostly. And it was all over these just tit for tat. You shot one of ours, we'll shoot one of yours. And um, Harlesden at that time was was really getting... Because you had a number of the crews. I mean, you'd have Church End, you'd have, you'd have Love and Money, you'd have like the Much Love crew... Um, and then it expanded and it, yeah, they, such terrible wastes of, of young lives. And I, I, you know, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the answer is. How easy is it for these kids to get guns? Too easy. Yeah. If, if you're on in the right area, you know, the right people, it's, it's as easy as ordering from just eat, you know, you can, I mean, people will call up guns. There are people that will rent you out a gun. And if you use it, you're going to have to pay it back. You're going to have to buy it. But if you don't use it, you know, and there's an awful lot of guns now out there that are, um, what do you want to call it? Um, like the Bicals and the Brococks that are starting pistols or replicas that are then converted. So, yeah, it's too easy. You can have kids, 14, 15-year-olds walking around with guns. So you moved to become a detective then. Yeah. Does that take some special training? Yeah, it's a, well, it was a process. It was an accreditation process. So I had to work as a trainee investigator. I did that at Kilburn, and I did that for about two and a half to three years. How different was Kilburn? Kilburn was, it was, um, at that point, it was very white and quite white and quite Irish. It depends where you were. Um, large amounts of people came over from Ireland to work on in the building trade you had a big pub on what was it called was it called biddy mulligans biddy mulligans on kilburn high road and the all the the irish builders would wait at the bottom of the road um down by um on on the edgeware road to get picked up for day labor now some of these guys are super skilled guys and they're making good money and they get paid in check at the at the end of the week and it could be a good old amount of money. Well, the man at Biddy Mulligan's would um, cash their checks for them there and then. So they'd walk in for a check for 1,500 quid and they'd get it cashed at Biddy Mulligan's. So he used to keep enormous great stacks of cash. And um, of course he knew he was a sensible bloke because he knew if he'd cashed someone's 1,500 quid check, probably they were going to put 200 quid of it behind his bar. So yeah, it was a busy, busy area. But it was, again, it was very different. That end of the borough by Biddy Mulligan's all around there was very Irish. But then you go closer down towards sort of Queen's Park, um, and some of the estates, South Kilburn Estate, around there, they they had their their gang problems. Um, but it was a, it was a bit more diverse in terms of a spread uh, than Harlesden. And then when I, after that, I went as a detective. I went to Islington, and Islington was different again because it was very Cockney. It was still Cockney. So you know, I went from hearing all the the accents from the the patois and all that to, all right, mate, fucking hell, Jesus, it's getting you, you know, all that. So it was a big change. But again, Is- Islington, a much bigger spread for some quite challenging estates through to some very, very serious money. You know, like I know, Tony Blair and all that lot all lived in Islington. And our current prime minister lived in Islington at that time. So again, that brought different challenges. Um, enjoyable place to work. And I stayed there for three years. How did your duties change? Um, that was, again, you would work. I mean, you wouldn't work regular night duties. You'd do night duty CID, oh, I don't know, probably four times a year, where you'd do a week of nights. The rest of the time, you'd either work earlies or lates. So you were either sort of start at eight, to, do an eight till four, or you'd do a two till ten. And then you'd be there for cover if people arrested serious crime prisoners, things like that. Or you'd have your own caseload. So you get a caseload of crimes allocated to you as they came in. And that could be anything from sort of frauds, drugs, serious assaults, uh, Things like that. And then you'd have your caseload to manage. And, um, you know, it was busy. It was busy. You could find yourself carrying quite a lot of crimes. You could find yourself carrying 20, 30 crimes at any one time. Can you talk about your experience with human King, yeah. I, when I, this is spin forward a few years, I... We're going to call it, because YouTube has a problem with that word, we're going to call it human transport. 
Who has a problem with it? YouTube. YouTube. Community guidelines. Yeah. Um, we have to spin forward a few years here. Um, when I left, I mean, I went from Islington. I'd spent five years on the homicide team, which we can talk about a bit later if you like. Um, and then I went to Camden, worked at Camden for a bit. I went back to uniform for a few years. I was a custody officer as a sergeant. And from there, I went to, I was seconded to the Home Office, Immigration Enforcement, as a DS, Detective Sergeant. And a big part of our work there was uh, facilitation of immigration crime. So it was looking at large scale breaches of immigration crime, quite often by professionals. Now, a, l a large part of that was human transportation. So bringing people from it can be within the uk we tend to think of it as coming in from outside the uk into the uk to to be exploited that's the key part to be exploited now that can be for sexual exploitation um, that can be for human slavery or something like that unpaid work so we would be given i mean you had teams that work specifically for things like modern slavery within the met when I was seconded to the Home Office, we had a broader view to look at how it impacted immigration crime. Now, I we certainly the best example of this I can give you. Um, we knew of a solicitors firm in East London called Ali Sinclair Solicitors. Um, we had numerous intelligence reports that they were facilitating sham marriages and other breaches of immigration law on a very large scale now we started looking into this now, Ali Sinclair solicitors were based in East Ham and they were very busy now they had put through back in those days if you wanted to get married if you're a foreign national living in the UK you would have to apply for a certificate of approval to marry now they would usually marry someone from the EU as opposed to a British citizen because funnily enough, back in the days when we were a member of the EU, if you marry someone who's an EU citizen, you're, you could get rights to remain much quicker than even if you married a British person. So the, the choice generally was to marry um, EU nationals. So you get a non-EU national. So generally, for this particular firm, it was Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, Ghana, places like that, where you needed a visa to remain in the UK. What the gangs would do would be to bring women from predominantly Eastern Europe, but also places like Portugal, and bring them to the UK, where they would seek to exploit them in a number of ways. One of which, you know, that a lot of them were put into prostitution and or possibly human slavery. So, you know, working for free. But as a side issue, they would get them to perform to go into a sham marriage with someone from somewhere like Pakistan. Now, what the main solicitor there, Nazaka Ali, was doing was he was processing the paperwork for these marriages, knowing full well that these were sham marriages. He was also linked into a couple of fixers who would be responsible for bringing these girls in. Now, there was a gang of Czech people who would move people from the Czech Republic and Slovakia to the United Kingdom. There was a gang of them. They were called Iveta Virogova, uh, Ludmila Nistarova, Wojtek Virag. And there are several others. And they are being invested by one of the human teams in the Met. Transport. Transport. <laughs> that was their name, though, at the time. <laughs> um, so one of the transportation teams in the Met. But they said, we think there's a link with your solicitor. And so we managed to prove by telephone records that there was this big link. Now, these this Czech group were bringing in a large amount of girls from the Czech Republic, but from very, very poor areas. Now, we, I don't know if you've been to the Czech Republic, like Prague, yeah. beautiful. You go a few miles away from Prague to places like Mimon, they're not the same. They are very poor areas. Education is not good. There is no employment. So they, these girls are easy meat for these transporters. Sorry. It's okay, James will fix. This, this is going to be a this is James gonna be an James editing on nightmare because it. it's in, instinctive for yeah. me to say that. <laughs> so these girls were brought to the UK. A lot of them would be put to work in brothels, but nearly all of them were put through sham marriages as well. Now we were on the edge of striking against this solicitor's firm, but it's so tricky to strike against a solicitor's firm because of legal privilege. 
because you, if, if you have a solicitor, your relationship with him, all the information between you and him is privileged, can't be looked at. I'm not allowed to look at it. You have to prove that it's in the furtherance of crime. Now, in order to do that, you have to get an independent barrister called special counsel to look at it all first before you can look at it. Horribly expensive to do. But the gods were on our side because Panorama decide, had heard the same information and decided to send an undercover reporter in. And we got a telephone call from Panorama to say, we are about to film a program and release a program called My Big Fat Fake Wedding. Now, to anybody watching, if you put this into YouTube, you'll find it. An undercover reporter went in with his nephew and spoke in... Urdu, I, I think, um, to Mr. Ali, who then clearly was involved in procuring brides to... I mean, he did actually make it clear, I don't s supply brides, but get rid of this one because she's no good and all this sort of thing. She knows too much. She's heard us talking. And um, anyway, they told us they were going to do this. So we then watched this programme and thought, oh, God, that's going to bring the work on. So the very next day he was arrested. The solicitor was arrested refused to answer any questions we then from that moment it took me three years to uncover this it took me three years working full-time on it with another cop uh, a dc he put everything into his defense literally everything into his defense he spent a fortune on his defense employed a qc and a junior and what this gang this czech gang the czech gang were arrested by the met unit and they were prosecuted and sentenced to long periods of time, nine years, for bringing girls over to the UK for exploitation. We then built a case against this solicitor. And uh, he eventually, we found him guilty of a number of offences. And he was sentenced to six years in prison with a very, very large proceeds of crime confiscation against him as well. So, yeah, it's a huge, horrible, repulsive problem and it it continues this very day because there is an enormous amount of money now the fact that we are now no longer in the eu has changed things a little bit because they can't use the eu route now the eu route so to marry somebody from the eu so it was surprising how few i mean i think his firm there are at least well over a thousand certificate of certificate of approval applications the vast, vast, vast majority of those were to people from Latvia, Lithuania, Portugal, Czech Republic, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, which is surprising. So that end of the market has slightly changed. Still happens. And of course, now human slavery seems to be more of a problem now. How so? Because the, the marriage route is not so attractive anymore. Because it used to be, if you married an EU citizen, you'd have your visa within six months. You would then, if you were a British person, it would be more like two years. And even then it was tricky. So it, it, was, it was a weird thing. And the thing is, within the EU, there used to be time limits on how quickly the applications had to be processed, which was six months. And if you didn't process them within the six months, the UK was liable for massive fines. I mean, massive fines. So it was really uh, they used to be quick to deal with these and also they wouldn't investigate them closely they uh, would just rubber stamp them to get them done that's what i was going to ask like in america to get a green card you've got to like live with the person and they interview you and they see you've got joint bills and joint bank accounts and all that kind of stuff Ask what your favorite color is how yeah. how you say none of that happens well, no, it, it, well mar it did it did but the whole there was an industry that would be built up alongside this so You'd go into the solicitor's firm. This is on. This can be watched on on YouTube. They would um, go in, and he would say, or you know, go uh, yeah, go and get some photographs taken. Go to the park now. Get some fo photographs taken, sitting on the swings together, eating ice cream together. You know, bullshit. Use the word bullshit. Uh, you know, a solicitor use the word bullshit. There would be then somebody else that they would have access to who could produce this old sort of this two year. Um, joint bills things like that they just put them into photoshop and they would just so just complete fake narrative was they, created. they would put but because of this ticking clock hanging over and the pressure to get these things the decisions made they would just rubber stamp them and you know over a thousand certificate of approval through one firm and you know the the, the, the sums involved were eye-watering i mean the, the proceeds of crime 
uh, sum for him was not far short of two million quid. So it's real serious money. And Panorama to thank for this. Did they film the arrest? They didn't film the arrest, no. Were you um, present? Oh, we were all there. I mean, we weren't there when they did. They literally, they just said to us, basically, watch Panorama tomorrow, boys and girls. So we watched it and it was, oh, this is not good. Well, it is good, but it's a lot of work. So I then had to go to the production company um, called Blast Films, who were in Camden. And of course, they say, and they always say this, any investigative journalist worth their salt would say, we will give you the, um, the, the unedited footage, but you've got to get us a court order. And I don't blame them for that. They're journalists. They're not here to support prosecution. So I then have to get a production order. I have to go to court, swear before a judge that I need this. The judge says, right, we'll order it. He then gave us all this unedited footage. And it was hours and hours. And I am no editor. I'm glad we've got people like you to edit this because I am no editor. So I then had to go through and get it all transcribed. And, you know, but what it did give was a snapshot of the inside of this solicitor's firm, the unedited footage queuing out the door to get to see this solicitor queuing out of the door big market big huge market and huge money and it, it has been going on for a long time and it's still going on now there are all you know there are other visas like we nothing against the legal profession some of my very good friends are lawyers but there was another lawyer who, how much time did that one get six years and did he serve half of that he served half of it yeah, yeah. Three years. Yeah. But of wow. course, it's, I mean, he struck off the, uh, the SRA, Solicitor Regulation, Regulatory Authority, struck him off. Uh, it cost him an awful lot of money and, you know, changed his life beyond recognition. So he's ruined thousands of women's lives and he gets three poxy Yeah, years. I mean, it's not yeah. great. There are a lot, there, I mean, he was part of, a, of an industry ruining lives. Yeah. Um, but, and that's what it is. It's an industry because human beings are valuable commodities whether you're going to then put them into... Because it's happening all the time now. Vietnamese people running cannabis farms. It used to be most of the cannabis in the UK was smuggled in. The majority of the cannabis out there now is grown in the UK. And people from Vietnam have got that nailed in. So they will bring people in on student visas, whatever the case may be, to work in the cannabis farms. So this exploitation of people, people are valuable commodities. And... Um, yeah, no, it's shocking. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Before I ask you the question, you were going to another story on the same subject. Oh, yeah. So I was. I do this a lot. Yeah, another solicitor. There was um, another solicitor called Osman Sadiq, again working in East London, and he had been a protege of Nazakat Ali. He used oh, to God. work with Nazakat Ali. He set up his own firm, uh, immigration specialist, and he was um, doing what were called a Zambrano carer's visa. Now, this is where... Now, the, 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 the conditions of this visa are very, very restrictive. You have to be basically related to the person to be their carer. So you would then, if you're a British citizen, you would say, I want this person to remain in the UK because I require their care because I'm disabled or elderly or whatever. But the rules are quite strict in that you basically have to be related to them. Well, this list convinced a, an awful lot of women from um, Brazil that they could apply for Zambrano carers visas. And again, it was nonsense. None of them were going to be going to get these visas granted. And yet he took thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds off them. So exploit it. So it's not just about these people, these immigrants from these other countries. They are they're hugely exploited themselves. You know, I mean, Mr. Ali, Nazaka Ali, he would take instructions and take money off people for applications that had no chance of success and it making himself fortunes absolute fortunes no conscience no and then you'd see them with you know rolex watches everywhere driving around in bentley's audi q7s all this sort of stuff all off the basis of, of, of this misery of exploiting humans so it's a horrible trade it's a horrible trade so what happened to him got six years no oh, that's the same one same one he got six years as well wow Let's go back then to the five years in homicide. Yeah, yeah, that was um, a very good job. That was an interesting job. Um, it was at the time it was called the Murder Suppression Team. Murder Suppression. They, yeah, they they changed it to the Homicide Task Force after after I joined. the 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 role of the it was twofold. It was like it was doing manhunts. So you'd get um, a murder happens. Most murders you tend to know who's done it quite quickly. Because, I mean, not always, but even then, or you get a good sniff. Someone gets shot, the phone rings somewhere. 
someone will say the rumor is so and so has done it you start looking to it and you see that he's moving in the right circles you think right we've got to look at this guy what's happening with his phone so you sell site his phone it's heading north on the m1 he's going somewhere okay it could be him they would then scramble us and it would be up to us to try and find him like that program the hunted kind of like that yeah yeah that kind of thing Kind of that thing. So you're saying then the perpetrator has left a trace through his phone. He's left a trace through phones or through banks or through AMPR, yeah. something like that. You know, AMPR, where, you know, number plates are auto- you know, connected in. They get automatically read and they'll, you'll ping all over the country. So we would then be dispatched to go and try and find that person, wherever it was they may be. So that was one big part of our job. We did a lot of that. But we would also, it would be a case of, there's been this murder we can't solve it we think it is mr x but we can't prove it and they can't prove it for a number of reasons now it may well be that the reason we think it is mr x is because the intelligence comes from a source that we could never reveal so we can say we think it's you well why do you think it's us can't tell you well that's no good you can't prosecute a man for that so what they would say to us is we are very convinced that it is mr x so we would then look to target Mr. X for whatever he's up to. Because the, the general reason, like, most murders that you solve very quickly are either domestic or silly fights that have gone wrong. I mean, the shocking fact is, if a woman is murdered, it's a 50% chance that it's a, a current or former partner. Current person. That's a statistical fact. 40 something percent, I think. So if it's a female that's the victim, you tend to know where you're looking. There are obviously ones where you don't know because they're they're gang shootings or just a random one. They're really rare. But if it does happen. So then I don't even know what my point was. Oh, yeah, no, I do. I'm going. I can get my point back. What would happen is they would say, look, you got Mr. X. We think he did this because this intelligence source suggests that he did this. Now, that can be like it can be human intelligence. It can be technical intelligence. Things I can't talk about. So we want you to target him and find out what he's doing. Well, that type of person is probably a career criminal. So what we would look at is, well, what's his criminality? You look at his criminality and you will then put all your efforts in to finding him doing something bad. On the whole point is take him off the streets. There is someone there who has a predisposition to kill. Because if you've killed someone once before, the chances are you're not going to be averse to doing it again. So the whole idea there is we can take someone like that off the streets and do some good. Um, there was one case to give you an example of that. There'd been a murder. I think it was outside of school. And we knew who did it. And he got arrested. And we, But then we knew who... We got intelligence as to who had supplied the firearm that shot that person. But we couldn't prove it. And so we thought, well, we got this bloke needs taken off the streets. Because if he's supplying guns that are being used in firearms, he's going to be doing it again. We also knew he was a drug dealer. So we use all resources we had available to us, technical and human. So we were, we were a surveillance team as well. We had our own surveillance capacity. So we put this guy under surveillance and we had an armed surveillance team with us as well. So, you know, people with surveillance officers who've got guns in case this bloke pulls a gun. Um, and we followed him around for quite a long period of time. Um, and then the intelligence came on top. We knew there was a big deal going down. There was a big deal going to go down. And... A hard stop went in on him as a response to that. Found something in his car, went back and searched his property. And we find, I think it was five firearms. It was, I think, five kilos of coke and a quarter of a million ecstasy pills. And this guy had a history. He got 20 years. So that was the sort of the type of thing we would do. Um, And that that was really good. That was really rewarding work. Because you think, well, this is... This is he's not going to be doing this. He's not going to be able to supply firearms that are going to end up killing people. Um, so so that that was really good work. We we would also get told, you know, we want some lifestyle on this guy. We really fancy this bloke for this murder. Um, can you put some surveillance on him? And so we'd do that just to get their lifestyle. So you knew where they went, where they got up in the morning, where they went to bed at night, who were they associating with, what were they doing during the day. It would all help build the picture and it might support the evidence, you know, uh, as to where they move geographically and things like that. The biggest example of that uh, that everyone will have heard of will be Levi Belfield. Do you want to tell the viewers what that case is? 
Hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a quick word from our sponsor. Know what that sound means? It's more sales being racked up on Shopify. What do you think of Shopify, Jen? I absolutely love Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to sell, grow, and make money for your business. Have you used it to boost your business? 100%, yeah. (laughs) So Shopify makes it simple for anyone to sell from anywhere in the world. From creating your online shop in your own look. To finding new customers, to scaling your burning idea. You can do it all from one place. With no need for skills in design or coding. It's how every minute of every day, a new seller makes their first sale with Shopify and you can join them. So what is your favourite UK-based business that's found success with Shopify? It's got to be Gymshark. They have grown massively thanks to Shopify. Now it's your turn to start selling today with Shopify for free. And thanks to 24-7 support, Shopify is there to help you every step of the way. Sign up for a free 14-day trial at shopify.co.uk slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Go to shopify.co.uk slash Sean right now to grow your business today. So that's shopify.co.uk forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. Yeah, Le- Levi Belfield was a serial killer. He killed, um, that we know of, um, three women, Marsha McDonald, Amelie Delagrange and Millie Dowler. He also attempted to kill Kate Sheedy when he ran her over and then reversed over her again. Um, they fancied him very strongly for the murders of Marsha McDonald and Amelie Delagrange, who were killed in basically around, around the Tookenham area in southwest London going into um, Surrey. So they said... We really think it's him, but we don't have a huge amount of evidence. The evidence was sketchy. Colin Sutton was the SIO. Colin's been on everything. Obviously, Levi Belfield. Most people have seen the dramatisations with Martin Clunes. I'm sure all your viewers will have watched that. It's a tremendous dramatisation. Martin Clunes captured Colin Sutton fantastically well. Um, So they said, we want you to follow him. And we want it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, that's not usual because it's expensive there's a lot you know it's expensive and it's time consuming there's a quite a few people on a surveillance team it's not just what people imagine it's not a bloke a couple of blokes in suits with kebabs and pistachio nuts <laughs> okay up a, tr- up a tree with binoculars yeah exactly <laughs> this is a team of people this is you know this can be half a dozen cars this can be motorbikes vans just to follow one person around so we followed him around 24 hours a day seven days a week split our team into two teams and got some reinforcements and we followed him around. He was wheel clamping. That was his job. He had a van and he had some wheel clamps and he would go around and do the private wheel clamping on private ground. So we followed him around for those 10 days. And, uh, you know, he was a horrible man. He was just the worst human being. You, even looking at him through binoculars or down a camera lens or anything, you could just tell the way he carried himself, you know, just this, they always talk about this, the, the narcissism of a, of a psychopath, you know, of a sociopath, this swagger that he had. And, uh, you know, I'll give another. I mean, again, this is this is not news. Everyone's seen this before. But he was out in West London, Middle, Middlesex somewhere, and he pulls out. He's in his van, pulls alongside a bus stop, and there are two girls, uh, two young girls, 12, 13, something like that, in school uniform. So it gets reported up the chain. This is what he's doing. They said... Don't let them get in the car. Don't let those girls get in the car with him. Whatever happens. Is that what he was doing, trying to get them in? Well, he he would fancy him. He would literally stop any girl in the street, you know, and say, hey, baby, do you fancy a bit sort of thing? Um, Which is, you know, potentially why Marsha and Amelie were killed. It may well not have just been run up until... He may have propositioned them and then being turned down, he was enraged, you know, because who who could refuse him, so to speak? So, I mean, he said to these girls and whatever, and then there was a confrontation and a bit a bit of um, a to-do, and he swore, I told him to fuck off, and got in his van and drove off. So one of the guys went and scooped these girls up and took them in, and they did, and, and interviewed them, and they just said, yeah, no, he was being really weird and saying strange things to us. And well, what strange things? He said, I bet you're really tight. Oh. And it really brought it home what we were dealing with. And... The, the pressure that that put on you, knowing that it, he wasn't just going out wheel clamping, he was looking at women all the time as to, and if the opportunity arose, what would he do? Could he? And, you th- and the one thing they said is, 
don't watch him kill someone. You know, it's one thing to surveil someone that we're as much as we were there to get evidence, we were also there to hopefully stop him killing anybody or you know attacking anyone. And so the pressure of crap, what if we lose him? You know, and he'd go back home, living in West Straight and out by Heathrow Airport, and then you'd you'd have to plot up his house and be ready for him to move overnight and watch his door overnight. And then the pressure of, I cannot fall asleep. I cannot fall asleep. I must stay focused. And then we got told that we're going to take him out in the morning after 10 days. And they said, so stay with him all day. Don't lose him for Christ's sake. So we stay with him all day. And then he goes, I remember it was freezing cold. And he goes into his little estate and goes in and the lights go out. So we then, right, okay, hold him all, you know, stay with him all night and we'll be putting his door in in the morning. So we do that, stay with him all night, freezing cold. You know, there are people watching from unheated places. So really, really hard, really horrible. And then in the morning, they get the phone call, right, we're approaching now, we're going in. So you can stand down and go back to West Straight and wait for us there. We get a call about 15 minutes later. He's not here. Oh, so oh christ and then we're thinking what the bloke who had the eyeball on the door said uh, most of the night he goes i'm telling you he didn't come out the front door he didn't come out the front door eyes on the back well yeah we, we get the thing and we get a phone call from someone and they said murph's gone mental and murph was the detective chief superintendent it was a lovely guy but he blew hot he was tempestuous his, apparently his words were, whoever's lost him is going to be driving a fucking panda car on Monday morning. Um, but anyway, we then about, I don't know, 45 minutes later, we get a phone call. He's in the loft and he was naked in the loft, in the very far recess of the loft, underneath the insulation. You know, the horrible fiberglass. I can't even bear getting it on my fingers. Imagine getting it on your <laughs> stitch your skin. Yeah. yeah. So he's there and then he... Um, in, and to be fair, to, I mean, his girlfriend was in there that he lived with and she was the one who she went uh. eventually. And she was terrified of him. And then they got him in custody. And initially, I mean, I wasn't with him in custody. That was up to the, the homicide investigation team. We and At first, he was in the same way as it, him being a psychopath, being a, a narcissist. He thought he could talk his way out of it. And he was all jokey with them and joshing with them and all this but once he realised and it went on, obviously he got questioned a lot over a period of days, he disengaged completely and would turn and face the wall when he was being interviewed. But then his girlfriend said, I've been raped by him oh. over the years. And she gave a witness statement. He was charged with rape and then remanded in custody. And then the inquiry could continue and they got enough evidence then to um, pro uh, convict him for Amelie and Marsha. And then eventually they got enough evidence to convict him for Millie Dowler as well. How did they get that evidence? It, w it was no one thing. It's like many cases, you, you hear cases and talk about circumstantial evidence. As, and some people say, well, it's just weak, it's circumstantial. Circumstantial evidence can be incredibly powerful because it's not one thing. It's a whole heap of things about where his phone was at the time, a van that they've attributed to him flashing up on some uh, CCTV, the fact that... Um, Marsha's phone was found in the canal that her keys were found in the canal it, and there was a, a, a shopping list that his girlfriend said to put him in a supermarket at a particular time together with the receipt so it wasn't one thing it was a whole load of very small things that added up to what would you know it was a strong case of course he's eventually he'd admit he's admitted and accepted his guilt he's on a whole life tariff he's never gonna he'll die in jail and we've heard recently of him saying he should be allowed to marry. Well, he can do one as far as I'm concerned. He, he, forego, you know, he foregoes that right. Yes. That right is gone as far as I'm concerned. Who knows what will happen? And, of course, he recently suggested that he was responsible for the murder of Lynn and Megan Russell. Now, I don't know about that. I don't know if it's the case. Is it just Levi Belfield wanting to keep the attention on himself? A man with like that, a narcissist like that, he wants the attention on himself. Um, which is, you know what, the whole marriage thing. Is that the same thing? Is that the same thing? Look at me, I'm still here. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, it, 
it, it, it was a it was an interesting case to be on um but the pressure was strong you know scared really scared and not because i'm going to get in trouble some poor per someone might die an innocent person could be killed if i don't do my job properly have you come across any more serial killers like that um not personally no i didn't ever work on anything else like that i well, mean thankfully well, they're very you know they're quite few and far between what were the other high profile homicides um, there was one uh, called Tom Aparice Price, who was a young solicitor. This actually did garner a lot of public attention at the time. He came out of Kensal Rise Station in West London, in between sort of Kilburn and Harlesden. And he was robbed and he was stabbed for basically nothing. Just literally, I think they, they stole his Oyster card. A guy called Donnell Carty. I can't remember the name of the other guy. It's just time goes by and you deal with so many people and they just stabbed him for no good reason they robbed him he probably put up a bit of a fight and they stabbed him and he died and he was this good man you know a, a solicitor who worked for people and with a really nice family and um we got the intelligence i think they some cctv evidence and there was some intelligence they could have been involved from various use of oyster cards and things like that because they used his Oyster card, they stole his Oyster card from him, and they used it, and obviously that timed up with CCTV. And um, we decided, because of the sort of threat, we had an armed surveillance team on them, and we were backed up by an armed intervention team, and we arrested him at Cricklewood Station on a hard stop, and he was arrested at Cricklewood Station. And he and... They basically blamed each other. Him and his co-defendant blamed each other, but they both got convicted. Good. What about homicides of kids? Um, do you know what? I don't think I ever dealt with a homicide of a kid. I don't think I was ever involved in that. What about people who are attracted to kids? Again, that's a very specialised environment that I possibly deliberately avoided. Yeah, I don't blame you. Um, I know people who worked extensively on it. Uh, a friend of mine, her job for basically two years was to watch pornography. Oh, oh my God. Eight hours a day. That must have blown her brains out. I I, I, I think possibly because, you know, I, I, it's just per a personal thing. I, I, fantastic work. Someone needs to do it. To stop those bastards. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. It's just something I didn't do. And there was no, no reason for that. I possibly shied away from it. But you Could, said in People... Um, what was it, People Magazine, I want to say, a People article, that it took its toll on your family relationships as Yeah, well. that was iNews. Um, it did, because I, I was so dedicated to it. Certainly was on the homicide team. There was no job I wouldn't say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. I, I was so wrapped up, because every job when we were on the homicide team was urgent. Every They only called us when it was urgent. Now, we, and we weren't the biggest team in the world, and there's a thing that people always forget is when everything's urgent, nothing's urgent. Everything's the same. So to us, it, but everything was there. And we would be working ridiculous hours. You know, you'd go to work thinking you were going for a normal day. And then a call would come in. And it would always come on a Friday because one of the other teams wouldn't be able to find him. They'd say, oh, let's see if the homicide task force can find him. And so you get it on a Friday. And then so you, you're thinking you're going home at three o'clock or whatever. And the phone goes, and then the next thing you know, you're in a car driving to Manchester to try and find someone. And then you could be there for a week. And I had two young kids at the time. So this would be, what, 2004. So my, my kids would have been 11, 12, you know. I was never at home. I, I, was, I was always out. And it, you'd work an 18, you know, 16, 17-hour day. You'd get home, fall into bed. You're thinking, oh, I've got to get up in the morning to go in for another job. And then the phone would go at 2 a.m. We've had another shout. There's another shout. Can you get in? And because I was always at work and never seeing my family, obviously, you know, it takes a real hit on your marriage. And my marriage didn't survive it. My marriage didn't survive it. And then it was, it was that that made me change and made me look at myself and say, do you know what? I don't think I want to do this anymore. I think I want to do something different. And that made me take promotion because I met someone new um, and had another you know had another kid my other kids were sort of by the time we got diverse they would grown up I mean, one had gone off to the military the other is um at university 
and I'd met someone new and we were going to, my wife was pregnant and I said, I want to do something different now. So that's what made me move away from that line of work because it was just too much. It was too much. I was always at work and I was selfish because I was having great fun. You know, I was running around the countryside behind murderers and smashing in doors and bugging up people's houses and, and putting trackers on cars in the middle of the night and being like a spy. <laughs> and I was in my own little private James Bond type movie <laughs> thinking I was doing all this good. And yeah, OK, the work was good. And I worked hard and everything. And you, know, you were thinking, oh, that's great because I'm earning loads of money. But I had nothing to show for it because it just all got spent in the same way that it always does. And then that is what made me then say, you know what, I think I'll step away. And whereas the job, I went to Camden as a, as a sergeant, a uniform sergeant, took promotion. And whereas I worked, I mean, the hours are long, they were like day shifts, night shift. I knew where I was and I had loads of days off and it, that was quite nice. And then when I went to the home office, the work was more slow time. It was more considered, it was more building a case, which you, I mean, there was overtime, but it wasn't mad overtime. Like I... You could easily earn 100 hours overtime a month. You know, you could easily be doing 16 hour days, six days a week. And it it's catastrophic to relationships. Going back to the homicides, then, you know, you've described various homicides, like people taking phones to the scene or petty crime that ends up with a murder and uses the guy's oyster card. What about what was the most professional hit you ever investigated that it was a struggle to solve? Um, if you're going to go down the road of professional, I'll tell you this one, this story, because this is a good story. Um, we got word from a human source that someone was touting for a contract killer to take out a couple of people. They didn't know why or why or who or anything, but he'd heard it and he'd been asked to see, can you find someone? And we said, oh, yeah. No, he had been approached to do it by a middleman. But he was on the side of the angels, shall we say. <laughs> and so we said, all right, can set up the meet and see what happens. So he set up the meet and we thought, well, the only thing we can do, we don't know what we're dealing with here. We don't know who we're dealing with, with what the targets are. We know nothing. We just have to disrupt this and stop it happening. This is a big point. I like to make this point because there's so much happening in the background of policing, serious policing like this, that you'll never hear about because it never makes the news because it never ends in a prosecution. And the whole idea isn't to prosecute, it's to disrupt. So we said, well, we'll get them to do the meet and we'll intervene. So we intervened and took out the guy this bloke was meeting. And the reason I wanted to talk about him was because he was like, the most intimidating man I'd ever met. But he wasn't big. He was smaller than me, so probably five nine, slim. Um, he was from Albania. And he was the most intimidating person I'd ever met. And he was polite. And there was no confrontation. He accepted his arrest stoically. Um, but then in his pocket... We found three names, no, two names, and there was some money. And the two names we had, you know, we, we did it and we, we arrested him for some load of old nonsense. And we also arrested the uh, man on the side of the angels, although, you know, he knew what he was doing. And then we could try to unpick this. And the two names in this guy's pocket we looked into and we managed to trace them. And they were innocents. They were complete innocents. They weren't criminals. They weren't fellow criminals. This guy had been working for the closest thing I can come up to as like an international supervillain. I won't mention, I can't mention his name. He lives in a part of the, the world with no extradition treaty. And he had ordered these two people to be taken out because they had crossed him within their legitimate business dealings. And he wanted them taking, taken out because of that. How much was their wife uh, their Sorry, I couldn't get it out. How much was their life we, worth? We never truly got to the bottom of it. There was a down payment that had been made, um, just to sort of in to start the ball rolling and to investigate and all that sort of thing. But we never got to the bottom of it. I mean, this was never going to end up in court. 
And that wasn't the purpose of it. The purpose of it, because we never prove it. You never prove it. The purpose of it was to disrupt it and stop it happening. So and, it, that, and that meant we were able to go to these people and say, look, this this is and and to get to the bottom of it but then to put the word out and to you then you can do an awful lot by putting the word out into the right circles we know this is going to happen and we will find you and we will we will get to you we will you know you might think you're safe from extradition but we will get you eventually because even if you might not get extradited you can very often persuade people in the country they're in to take them into custody you know you know a bit about international prisons and things <laughs> your life might turn out a bit worse than you are so it was never about so that why i mention it because this is the closest i ever got to what you'd call an international supervillain because this guy his history the contacts were ferocious and phenomenal um and it, what was it struck me was he was willing to do this for these two people who were they were no ones they weren't criminals they, it potentially also brings into the realm of the albanian mafia and other mafias uh, well yes i mean did, and, did you and, deal with mafia killings um the, the kind of the homicides I got involved with were mainly gang killings, so sort of domestic gang. Um, some of them white gangs, really. Some white gangs, the traditional white criminals you might think of. And a lot of them getting supplied by the Albanians. And- yeah, well, Albanians have taken over, we know this, Albanians have taken over cocaine distribution in the, in the UK. And because they deal with the Colombians direct, they get incredibly high quality cocaine and they can sell it at a good price. They, I've just written about it in that book that's sitting there. The Blood Tide. Which, um, and the, the book that follows that, Albanians have taken over co- cocaine supply. Now that's why this guy had something and he gone, he's gone. He fled back to Albania, wasn't welcome in the UK anymore. Um, and they, not welcome because... He d- blotted his copy copybook, not with us, but with his bosses. And these are dangerous people, and life is cheap. So that that I, I mentioned that one because he he was chilling, and he was chilling not because of what he looked like, but because how he conducted himself. Something in his eyes, I don't know. Crazy eyes, just cold, mm. ice cold. And I, when, when we got him arrested, we used the the TSG, you know, the, t- the rowdy vans type of thing to go and do hard arrest and take them out and so we could be a bit more in the background and as it went a, a couple of years later one of the guys who was on that van who was a uniform officer when i went back to uniform he says yeah i met a contract killer once we did this blah 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 oh, god he was cold he scared the life out of me i goes what's his name what this bloke's name and he goes yeah it was i goes yeah yeah, yeah i remember that what about one that perhaps you were that close to catching the perpetrator but they got away In terms of homicide, it is hard to say because we weren't, we didn't have the response to carry the responsibility for the murder. Our job was to support the murder teams with proactive um, strategies. So there would be ones where, I mean, a, a lot of police investigations are failures. Uh, loads of them are because you know you you have an incomplete picture, and sometimes you can't always join the dots. Um, there were, yeah, there were many where perhaps we didn't get there. Um, there was one case of these two brothers who were strongly suspected of murdering people. Um, they were very bad people, and they were they were importing cocaine from Ghana, somehow getting it in from Ghana. And I can remember because they were going off to the um, followed them to the airport, and we had their the inside of their house, the building where they were. We had that all lumped up we had cameras all over the place lumps on cars I remember following them to the airport going into the airport and then going behind scenes at the airport and going to baggage handling at the airport and getting their cases open and going through their cases and there's just nothing they were always clean and we were always sniffing around in the background doing things covertly and we never got there i think that they eventually got caught in fact they got caught after i retired um they, on a simple job fairly simple job where they got followed um, they thought they had something on and they threw over I think five kilos of coke they got them hot with five kilos of coke but they'd done a lot more than that they'd done a lot more than that so yeah there's loads of failures the world is littered with failures so have you watched a programme White, Ho- uh, White House Farm is it with Jeremy Bamber case yes I did watch that with yeah. uh, who was the star of that I, f- 
I did watch it. Yeah. Did you think Jeremy Bamba did it? <laughs> probably. But who knows? I think he probably did it. But I, I, I don't go into the minutiae of it. I watched the show. I mean, it was a while ago, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, a couple of years ago. And there's the whole thing about could he have, you know, could could she have done that and reached that? And uh, I, I, simple fact is, I don't know. No, it fascinated me that one. Yeah, it is. It is an interesting one. I don't know. Is is the reality? And I, I haven't devoted enough time to come up with a with a theory in the same way as Madeleine McCann. I stay out of that because it's 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 so divisive and and. I, I find when you look on the Facebook groups about it, it gets really quite toxic the way people argue amongst themselves about it. So I tend to stay out of that. So many theories about my There are so many theories. Yeah. And I mean, the world is full of, of theorizers and really nobody knows. That's the reality of this. We can have these strong ideas and these strong leads, but really yeah, the reality, nobody outside the investigations really knows, do they? We've got about 15 minutes left, cool. if you, which is an opportunity if any of your greatest stories we've missed out. God, I've been talking a lot. So, um, uh, I mean, it's... Did you ever get injured in the line of duty? Yeah. No, it's the old punch and kick. Uh, kicked in the head a few times. I got kicked in the head a couple of times once in a bit of a roll around. Didn't get bit by a monkey. No, I didn't get bitten by a monkey. <laughs> no, it's uh, I can't touch where I got away with it. Really, it was a funny one because in the police, there's, it's you have some people, some officers who are referred to as shit magnets, <laughs> and honestly, they are. And you think, oh god, I'm working with so and so tonight. Why? Not? Oh god, he's a shit magnet. And it would always be the same people. It honestly would. It would be the same people who got assaulted time and time again. Um, I rarely got assaulted. I did a couple of times. Um, there was a few things that, you know, there was one particular case where I had a strong suspicion that there was a pri private detective put on me personally because somebody really wanted to get off and they wanted to see if there was any dirt they could get on me. Didn't happen. I was living a fairly... Um, blame free life at that particular point in my is life that common no, no no that's not common at all but there was a lot of a lot of money riding on this one um it was a big case and there was a lot of money riding on it and they tried very hard to discredit me and fortunately they failed so it's been honestly it's a great career and it's given me so much material that i can now deploy <laughs> as a writer you know it, it's and i i don't necessarily I, I don't carbon copy characters because that's going to get you sued um, there is a striking resemblance between one vi villain and Levi Belfield but it's not like he can sue me is it it's not, it's not like I can harm his character I can only make it better um, so it has it's given me this rich vein of of characters of, of stories of, of things I can use to make the books feel as authentic as they can and it's, it's been a lease of life to me I, I've absolutely it's not me to model <laughs> I, I've loved I, I've loved it and I loved the career it was great but I, I like what I do now you know it's great to sit there and make up stories and come up with things that people you know that excite people and people go it's great when people go and say oh old colleagues who phone me and or send me messages and say oh man I absolutely love your book it's it's great in that and we, we were moved to tears watching you at crime con with the two women who were victims of domestic violence yeah that they were quite inspiring, weren't they? Weren't they? Um, I, and you know, shockingly, I forget their names now. Um, but the, the 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 young lady who was randomly stabbed, literally just walking down the street and was stabbed, but her attitude after that of forgiveness, and she she's forgiven him, and I I thought that was remarkable. And the other young lady who. Has, has taken her experiences and has turned them into something positive and to help others, you know. I find that really inspiring. It was really moving. It was a great panel to be involved in and I felt very it, lucky. It, that wasn't the know. guy, he was like wigging out on drugs or something, the guy on the street with a knife. Was yeah. That what? And, and she ended up forgiving him and she almost died, didn't she? She very serious injury and she really wanted to be a cop. But the injuries that it left her with have now precluded that as an option to her because she would, clearly, you know, the sort of attitude she has... The sense of fair play, the sense of forgiveness, 
Um, that sort of emotional intelligence that she carries meant to me she'd have been a terrific cop. And I said that to her on the stage. Um, so, yeah, that was great. I felt very privileged to be able to do that. So do you, uh, you do a lot of work with victims of domestic violence then? No. No? That's it not an area I worked con. in. That's not an area I worked in. Crime con, they asked me to appear... I don't really know why. I think it's because I'd been on some crime and investigation channel stuff, uh, doing some of the talking head for some of the shows on, uh, on on crime and investigation, and now that now Netflix and things is that I think that's why they invited me to be on, and um, it was fun. It was fun. I was you know I was, I was privileged to be able to do it. It's such a brilliant speaker. And if people want to check the books out, all the links will be in the description box below this video. I think he's up to like at least half a dozen. Seven, I think I counted last night. <laughs> and, um, most of them down here. If people want to contact you or get follow you on socials, which ones are you on? Uh, I'm probably most active on Twitter, um, Neil Lancaster 66. Um, I've got a website, Neil Lancaster Crime. Um, but Google me, I'm easy to find. All right, so please let us know in the comments what you thought about this video. Thank you for watching. All right, cheers, Neil. That was fantastic. <sighs> Yeah, appreciate it. No, no, it's been my yeah, brilliant, thank you. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I did talk too much, don't I? No, that's what we want. So, Gadfly Press is hugely proud to announce the publication of Killing Escobar and Soldier Stories by Peter McAleese. If you've not seen our podcast we've done with Peter, check it out. And the book is now available worldwide on Amazon in all formats and peter was hired out of scotland mercenary by the cali cartel to assassinate pablo escobar one of the most famous gangsters in the history of the world the mission is all detailed in the book as well as peter's many soldier stories from various countries and continents of the world so mind-blowing gripping as seen on bbc tv this is the book, the story that Killing Escobar is based on, Peter McAleese's testimony. The link will be in the description box below the video, available worldwide on Amazon. Cheers.